So tonight uh, we take up uh, in our final segment on this gospel that we've been sort of trekking through now uh, for several weeks. Uh, and we come to what really is, uh, in a sense, the climax of this narrative, uh, which we find in, in chapters uh, 26 and 27, and uh, just uh, t chapter 28 is a very brief uh, chapter uh, that concludes the, the resurrection proclamation. And so we'll look at those, and I also put on your notes uh, that we can at least uh, move through uh, some uh, a summation of some major motifs. Uh, a couple of weeks ago when we looked at the community discourse, we took some time to also try to do a little synthesis of uh, Matthew's view of the community. Here I cast the net a little bit broader, but also uh, you know, boil it down to some essential items of what I would feel are the major motifs, and I hope it makes sense to you as we go through them from your knowledge uh, of, of Matthew. Uh, this we, we come, you know, we've been moving forward in the narrative structure of the gospel from its origins all the way in the infancy narrative reaching back into the history of Israel. And then the events surrounding uh, Jesus' birth in Bethlehem uh, and ultimately again through threat and tragedy uh, the Holy Family come to Nazareth in Galilee. Uh, and then uh, we had the entrance of John the Baptist on the scene as the adult Jesus that makes his appearance at the Jordan, uh, the baptism, the temptation, and then the entry into Galilee. And we saw in that long stretch uh, from the end of chapter 4 uh, through uh, to chapter 16 and beyond actually, that uh, Matthew concentrates uh, the gospel story on Jesus' Galilean ministry, uh, punctuated with discourses along the way, but also focusing on Jesus as healer as well as teacher. And then we saw in, in chapter 16 uh, at Caesarea Philippi in the confession of Peter that there's a shift in the gospel narrative and we begin to move from Galilee in the north, Caesarea, uh, Philippi, down through the Jericho Road and up to Jerusalem. And the focus then becomes by means of uh, this journey, but also by means of the Passion predictions, which appear now explicitly in the Gospel. The reader is oriented to Jerusalem, to the impending death and resurrection of Jesus, which he interprets following the lead of Mark as a giving of life uh, in service. And then we were in Jerusalem, and we saw it was filled with, uh, with controversy and conflict. Jesus entering triumphantly as the Messiah, uh, fulfilling the scriptures, riding upon the foal of the ass, uh, entering triumphantly into his city and entering into his temple, purifying the temple, uh, and then setting up in the subsequent uh, chapters, this series of, of sharp conflicts with his opponents, uh, with the priests, the elders, the Sadducees, the Pharisees. And then we saw there was this discourse we looked at last time of the apocalyptic discourse, sort of reaching out over the heads of uh, the characters in the gospel in a way to the future of the community as it stretches out into history. And uh, in a sense, the accountability, the leaders excoriated in chapter 23 for their uh, hostile reaction to Jesus, their failure to perceive who he is. Uh, the community called to fidelity, uh, good and faithful servants, the wise virgins, uh, the Gentiles themselves, perhaps, the world, we discussed that one parable of the sheep and the goats, uh, and who is that directed to? Maybe in the first instance in Matthew, it's how the Gentiles receive these representatives of the communities. If they receive them with instinctive uh, compassion and mercy and care and justice for them, the elements of the sheep and the goats parable in chapter 25, 31 to 46, that they, in a sense, already have the instincts uh, of the gospel. 
And all of that brought us uh, in the story to Jesus' prediction of the future as a future of, of travail and challenge, but the mission must continue. And Matthew, when uh, this is all completed, uh, if you look in 26, chapter 26, verse 1, uh, you have a sense that Matthew does sort of what I just tried to do in the sketch. When Jesus had finished saying all these things, uh, this formula, we've seen this transition formula at the end of the other discourses, but now it's panta, it's all these things. Uh, now finished, uh, uh, he said to his disciples, you know that after two days the Passover is coming and the Son of Man will be handed over to be crucified. Matthew gives a kind of formal introduction uh, to the Passion narrative. And uh, this story that takes up the whole of chapters uh, 26 and 27, uh, on, on one level uh, is, uh, you could call it maybe a doctrinal level, uh, it's uh, Matthew proclaiming that the death of Jesus transforms the world at the instance of his death, you know, the dead rise and you have the beginning of the new age happening as we'll look at in a moment. Uh, on another level, there's a, a kind of a paradigm here, object lessons, moral example. Jesus, as we'll see, the faithful son, trusting in God even in the face of death. The disciples responding in their weak way, their oligoi pistoi, their lack of faith. Uh, I remember a few years ago, I was uh, out in Orange, California and had a, like a Holy Week retreat for a community of sisters there. This was some time ago. And they had a beautiful uh, Easter morning mass out in sort of their gardens of, of this place. And you could smell the orange blossoms. It was very nice. You know? <laughs> and uh, after the, the reading was the reading about the people uh, coming, the, you know, the one for the day of uh, Easter from John, them coming, looking in the tomb, and they saw the face cloth folded off to the side. You remember the, it's, uh, and they look in and they're puzzled. And this woman came up to me afterwards and said she was a psychiatric social worker. And she worked at a federal prison nearby, and her, most of her clients were drug addicts. And she said, you know, uh, I was struck by this gospel because it reminded me how public crucifixion is and at times how hidden resurrection is, you know. And uh, she said that her clients, you know, they are people whose lives get destroyed by drugs and dealing and so on and they lose everything and uh, dignity and so on. But their, their resurrection, if they have one, comes when, you know, they start tying their shoes or putting a belt on, there's little things, the little signs of humanity coming back for them. Now, I've always been struck by that, that the passion narrative is very long. <laughs> it's very public, the failure of, you know, the death of Jesus, the confrontation with suffering, the failure of the community. And the resurrection, especially so in Mark, but also in Matthew, in a sense is in direction, an empty tomb, an encounter, you know, a promise, uh, and there's sort of that dynamic that the resurrection is sort of cast uh, into a future. But the, the focus of the community is on the reality of death and suffering that has to be endured and overcome uh, before resurrection is experienced. And I, I think there's some of the experience of the community in here. Uh, Matthew, in this section of the gospel, as we've seen so often, uh, is uses Mark as his uh, primary source. There's nothing really here from Q, uh, the saying source that he takes. Uh, there are some unique things in Matthew's presentation, but a lot of them seem to be traditions uh, proper to his own community. Uh, so uh, what's very interesting about the Passion narrative, it's so close to Mark. Matthew follows it so closely that the places where he departs stand out, you know. And you begin to see what is the very specific interest uh, of Matthew. Uh, also important for Matthew, as we've seen throughout the gospel, is the use of the Old Testament. 
uh, the Hebrew Scriptures, his Bible, his community's Bible. And I put there uh, the texts that will be very important. We will be focusing, as we get along here, on the death scene, which is the most important in chapter 27, obviously. But I wanted to at least uh, get some flavor, recall some flavor for you of, of the rest of the Passion story. One of the key things in Matthew's Gospel that is already in Mark's Passion account, but Matthew expands it, is the use of Psalm 22, uh, the great lament psalm, the paradigm of the lament psalms in the Old Testament. Uh, the, the words of Jesus, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? As you know, the first verse of Psalm 22. And, and what is very interesting, there are several psalms in the the book of Psalms that rate sort of being called a, a lament. Uh, Walter Brueggemann has written a lot about this, you know, and he, he has a statement at one point, people who don't lament don't care. So lament is different from complaint, say. <laughs> it's somebody really invested uh, and it's wrenched from the heart of, of the believer. And the lament Psalms, uh, the prayers of lament are very strong in the Hebrew scriptures. In the New Testament, the only person that really laments is Jesus. Yeah. It's a very, but it's carried over into our, you know, form of tradition of spirituality and prayer. And the lament is, it has a pattern, a very discernible pattern. I don't know if you, if you have your, your text there, you might just uh, flip to it quickly uh, without, uh, you know, being able to spend a, a lot of time on this. But the, the Psalm 22, the first part of the Psalms are very acute lament. Uh, some people have said Psalm 22 seems almost like uh, someone who is seriously ill. It's sort of like nightmare imagery uh, in, in the crying out in the nighttime. And so much of the details of the first uh, 21 verses of uh, Psalm 22 have found their way into the passion story. And uh, a lot of people think that what happened here is that very early on, you had a kind of enactment in the Jerusalem church of the key events of the passion, maybe even a procession, if you like, a prayer procession from place to place. And uh, the praying of the Psalms, and praying particularly of Psalm 22, uh, so eventually, as the passion narrative got shaped, uh, and it ultimately comes as a tradition, maybe an oral tradition to uh, the gospel writers, uh, that there's a kind of fusion of Psalm 22 with the account of Jesus' suffering and death. Uh, my God, my God, I cry to you, you do not answer. There, there's a constant, if you read those first few verses, there's a kind of dialogue, you know, it, it's uh, the, the psalmist is saying, you know, you, Ata, you are trustworthy, you are great, you were, you know, saved our ancestors, you are the most high. Well, a man, but me, I'm nothing. I'm a, mer a, a worm, my, you know, bones are melting within me. My throat is dry, it, it's just, I'm surrounded by so there's this contrast, God who is all powerful and the psalmist who is suffering intently. And so the, the, what emerges in the psalm as the key issue is, is God trustworthy? Yeah. Will God deliver the psalmist who cries out to him? Okay. It's very intriguing and Matthew is going to exploit this so strongly and it fits into his whole Jewish tradition. Jesus has been presented as the Israelite from the very beginning in the uh, temptation stories. You know, he relies on God's word. It's doing God's will. We've seen this over and over uh, in the theology of Matthew. And now death comes as a test of whether God responds, whether God is uh, sort of reciprocates with the trust that uh, uh, the psalmist puts in him. You look in verse 4, And you, our ancestors, trusted. They trusted, and you delivered them. To you they cried and were saved. In you they trusted. 
and we're not put to shame. But I am a worm, not human, scorned by others. Also uh, see me mock their heads. Verse 8, you know, commit your cause to the Lord. Let him deliver you. Let him rescue the one in whom he delights. <laughs> you know? So uh, it, it's very powerful. And then what happens in the second section uh, in, in, of, of chapter 22, uh, it, especially in, beginning in verse 22, from the horns of the wild oxen, you have rescued me. You know, uh, from the horns of the wild oxen, I will tell of your name to my brothers and sisters. I will praise you. You who fear the Lord, praise him. For he did not despise or abhor the affliction of the afflicted. He did not hide his face from me, but heard me when I cried out to him. And the, the praise, you know, this exuberance that changes without any rationale. You know, the, the rationale is almost in the cathartic praying of the psalm. The psalmist laments, and then there's a sense that God will deliver him. And there turns to praise, the second half of the psalm. And again, people think this also is like the, the substructure of the death scene of the gospel. Yeah. Uh, Jesus dies with Psalm 22 on his lips, and we'll see Matthew reinforces that. And God, in a sense, responds <laughs> by tearing the temple veil and opening the earth and bringing out the, the holy ones, uh, the earthquake and so on that, that it comes roaring out. So. The issue of trust in the midst of suffering. Uh, a second uh, Old Testament source that Matthew quotes is from the Book of Wisdom. And, and this is very intriguing uh, because wisdom uh, at the outset, I put the quote there, chapter 1, verse 12 to 16. This is like in sort of the preface to the Book of Wisdom where it's trying to account for evil. It's a famous passage, God created the world to be good. No destructive drug did he put therein, but humans made a pact with death and invited it in. Okay. So, so it's almost like a poetic reflection on the creation and fall story of Genesis. Okay. But then as you move into chapter 2, and I put those texts there also, 2, 12 to 20, the, the literary form of the second chapter of wisdom is a mockery. It has the, the mockers, the disbelievers, assaulting the one, it's the dikaios, our, our word that we've seen so often in, in Matthew, uh, that key word, the just one, dikaios. Remember the first words of Jesus in the gospel, I must fulfill all justice, dikaiosune, all righteousness. Uh, so th this concept, the just one, who is the faithful Israelite, who trusts in God, is mocked by the mockers for his trust. And the, what's uh, interesting, the Book of Wisdom quotes Psalm 22, <laughs> verse 8. You know, he relied on God, let God deliver him if he wants him. You know. And that's what Matthew quotes in the Passion Narrative. He adds that to the mockers in the Passion Narrative. So even the notion of mockery, the device of mockery, and I think mockery, you know, in a literary text like Wisdom, allows the author to have things said that are sort of unsayable. <laughs> okay. you know, I mean, the mockers can say terrible things. <laughs> They can put into question things that, in a sense, the believer doesn't dare even articulate. But the, uh, the mocker says, let us put him to the test and let's see if God is so great. Let's see if God will deliver him if he wants him. Uh, and, and so Matthew, that theology again of trust on the line because of the believer who, the dikaios, the just one who uh, followed God's will and trusted in God, will it, can it survive death? Know, the ultimate uh, challenge. So uh, again, uh, very interesting that Matthew incorporates into his version of the mockeries uh, these quotations from uh, Wisdom chapter 2. And then a final text that we'll see at the end, a, s a set of texts, the resurrection of the Holy Ones. This is found only in Matthew. These texts are, uh, Psalm 22 is intensified in Matthew, 
wisdom is added by Matthew, and Ezekiel and Daniel are added by Matthew. And this is at the very moment of the instant of Jesus' death, when you have the lifting, the opening of the graves and the raising of the saints, and they're marching in to, to appear in Jerusalem. This is from the vision of the dry bones in Ezekiel chapter 37. And it's also, again, in Daniel, in chapter 12, uh, verse 2, uh, I will open my, your graves, O my people, and lift you from the graves. And what's being talked about in these texts, uh, and we'll look at them sort of in their placement in chapter 27, is the resurrection of Israel. Okay. This is a theology prior, in a sense, to the more... Uh, explicit notion of resurrection of the body and resurrection of, you know, that you have uh, occurring in the maybe first or second century BC in Judaism. But the post-exilic visions of Ezekiel are, it's, it's the restoration of the people. You know, are the people dead? You know, the, uh, when he, the son of man, as uh, the prophet is called, is taken out in this dream sequence to the desert. And he sees the bones, the bleached bones filling the desert floor. God says to him, you know, son of man, can these bones come to life? And he says, only you, O Lord, know this. And then he says, I will breathe on these bones. I will breathe my spirit on these bones. And he breathes on the bones and they begin to, you know, the rattling of the bones, the great <laughs> uh, spiritual, but they send you together, they become a people. And then God interprets to Ezekiel, he says, this is the whole house of Israel. They were saying, our bones are dried up, we are clean cut off, but I will raise my people. <laughs> uh, a lot could, more could be said about this. Uh, we know from other instances in Judaism that this text of Ezekiel 37 was a very important rallying text for Judaism around the time of Jesus. A uh, copy of it was found in uh, the synagogue on the top of Masada. Okay. Uh, it was depicted pictorially in the Dura Europa synagogue uh, in Syria, uh, one of the earliest examples of synagogue art uh, in a place that was on the perimeter of the Roman Empire. And they had filled in this building uh, to use it as a defensive wall, casemate wall against the attacks of the barbarians. And what it did, it preserved the interior walls of, of the synagogue. And when they excavated, they found these almost like Grandma Moses type drawings. And one of them is a depiction of Ezekiel 37. And what's so interesting, it shows the Messiah standing there. He's like a stick man. And he's breathing little winged spirits down into the bones. And the bones are getting up and they're walking into Jerusalem. <laughs> So what's happened, this text has been reinterpreted as a messianic text okay, in Jewish art later, uh, you know, not so long, uh, uh, somewhat later than the time of Jesus, but not so long, maybe about the uh, second or third century. So in other words, th this text, what, what is going to happen in Matthew's interpretation of the death of Jesus is that this is a turning point in history, the people that seem to be dying you know, are going to be resurrected in a new people. Uh, you know, not totally discontinuous with Israel. We've been talking about this all along, but uh, there's going to be a resurrected people and a new age, which now will move the message of salvation out to the world. And it'll be the risen Christ that will articulate that at the conclusion of the gospel. So. Uh, Matthew here, the Old Testament uh, texts that are here are very important as they've been throughout his gospel and they give us some of the flavor and the focus uh, of his theology. I put here in this second segment, Mark is a prime source, but there are some significant changes. And I, I'm just listing them here and, and want to spend time, uh, you know, going forward into the, the final scene in chapter 27. But just uh, the figure of Judas figures much more prominently in, in Matthew's passion narrative than Mark. Judas has a speaking role. Okay? In, in Mark's text, he normally doesn't say anything. He just does the wrong thing. But Matthew, has, he's a rounded character. 
And also Matthew adds there, I put 27, 3 to 10, that's the suicide of Judas. Uh, Judas despairs, and uh, that's only in Matthew's Gospel. You have another totally different version of it in uh, Luke in the Acts of the Apostles. But in uh, Matthew, Mark just has Judas, uh, you know, committing the betrayal and going out, but Matthew fills out the story and has him uh, commit suicide. He throws the blood money uh, back to the high priest, back to the temple. They take the blood money and buy a field for it where strangers can be buried. And Matthew says all of this fulfilled the scripture according to Jeremiah. Okay. Uh, the problem is he quotes Zechariah. It's one of these instances where, you know, Zechariah has the right wording for Matthew, but Jeremiah has the right mood. So you put them together and it's a famous uh, instance of the freedom of the New Testament authors regarding the scriptures. You know, it's not like they read the scriptures and said, this has to be this way. No, they, they read the events and said, the scriptures conform to it. It's really, it's a reverse uh, type of uh, hermeneutic, if you like, or interpretation. So the figure of Judas, this whole thing, the 30 pieces of silver, which is from Zechariah. Also, Matthew wrapping the figure of Judas uh, uh, in this uh, example of a disciple who despairs. In contrast, Peter, whose sin is perhaps equal, uh, weeps bitterly, tears of repentance, and uh, is saved. The focus on the three for prayer in Gethsemane, we had talked a little bit about that in when we're looking at the disciples, the contrast with Mark. If you look at Mark's account of the Gethsemane, he has one, two, three, but those numbers enumerate Jesus coming to find the disciples sleeping once, twice, three times. Matthew subtly changes it so that the three now is Jesus going to pray three times. Okay. He finds the disciples sleeping, but the focus is on the repeated prayer. And the, the second prayer uh, is a quotation from the Lord's Prayer, uh, 2642, not your will, but not my will, but yours be done. So Matthew prays, Matthew Jesus prays the way he taught the disciples to pray uh, in, in chapter 6 of the gospel. Another curious emphasis, again, I know we're dancing through these, but uh, then slow down for the, the scene of the, of the death. Uh, the focus on choice. Uh, and I think this fits into Matthew's whole sense of accountability, of emphasis on doing the will of the Father, you know, the, the parable of the two sons, this, you know, it's, it's what you do, it's what you choose to do that is significant. And so you have a character that's not in any of the other uh, texts. Uh, Pilate's wife says, I have nothing to do with this just man, Dikaios, she calls him. I have suffered much in a dream because of him. She tries to intercede with her husband. This curious uh, scene that Mel Gibson's very grateful for, if they have that in there. And, and then if you were to look at Matthew's text and line it up with uh, Mark's text, it's very clear Matthew reinforces that this is a choice. Which of the two will you choose? What do you choose? Thelo, the word Thelo keeps coming. Pilate keeps putting it before them. And then climaxing with this scene where, with the intensification of the rejection of Jesus increasing, Pilate uh, takes a bowl of water and washes his hands clean. I am, you know, he's not guilty. Uh, he's innocent of these charges, innocent of this man's blood. And uh, that is from Deuteronomy chapter 21. It's not a Roman gesture. It's a Jewish biblical gesture. Uh, when there's been a murder, uh, the villages around, the elders come together and they cut a heifer in half. <laughs> and uh, the elders have to swear that, you know, we're innocent of this blood. Our village is not part of this. Okay, it's a way of discerning who is guilty and then uh, the, the process would go forward. And that's when the people say, his blood be on us and on our children. So they accept, uh, Pasolaos, Matthew says, the whole people that are there, 
the whole people. Uh, the crowd has been sort of back and forth, back and forth. But here, under the persuasion of the leaders, and Matthew is consistent in his indictment of the leadership, the leadership draw people uh, in the wrong direction. And here it's deadly what they do. And uh, their condemnation of Jesus and their acceptance of responsibility on us and on our children. And, and what's very important, and you can read this in the, the commentary, that the formula, his blood be on us or be on our head, is, is found several times in the Old Testament as a formula of acceptance of responsibility. But very often it's connected with the phrase, how olam, how olam, you know, forever and ever. His blood be upon us forever and ever. Okay? So that the, the, it's a full acceptance of responsibility, a dramatic, uh, definitive acceptance. Matthew does not have that. His blood be on us and on our children, and most interpreters uh, of Matthew see that as saying, from Matthew's point of view, it's the generation from Jesus to the destruction of the temple. Okay? That the destruction of the temple, as he's hinted at, in those parables of the wedding feast, the parable of the vineyard, is God's punishment for the death of Jesus. Okay. Still tough theology, but it's not forever. Okay. As this was interpreted in Matthew 27, 25, in history has often been cited by popes and others you know, as a reason for the eternal, uh, what would you say, uh, punishment uh, to be wreaked on the Jews. Someone recently, a rabbi here, sent me uh, a uh, citation from Pius XI when uh, at the beginning of the Nazi period and seeing the trouble coming, a very prominent European rabbi went to speak to Pius XI asking his public support for Jews to be able to emigrate to Israel. And the Pope uh, expressed sympathy, but demurred, and he cited the fact that it would not be appropriate for him, you know, given that God has cast a, a curse on the Jews, for him to be seeing as, you know, interpreting this in another way. It's rather remarkable, depressing <laughs> text, but it, it, this is the, you know, this is the dramatic change that the church has experienced in the modern period, but that was sort of routine uh, perspectives before. So we are also see in, in scene in alterations in the death scene and the burial. We will look at the death scene in detail. The burial is the fact that in Matthew uh, the leaders again, their animosity to Jesus extends beyond his death where they want to set a guard at the tomb because this imposter had said that after three days, so they put the guard at the tomb, and of course then there is the resurrection, and the soldiers are as if dead, and they go and tell their story, and they're paid off to say that the disciples came and took the body of Jesus, and Matthew notes that story has circulated among the Jews until this day. It's a very interesting, so a window opens, and you see the hostility between the two communities. Uh, uh, this alternate uh, uh, interpretation. But, but let's, I'm sorry to rush through those, but, but let's look, if you open your, your text to chapter 27 of Matthew, uh, a lot of this, what we're saying, uh, sort of comes to the fore in the way uh, Matthew presents things. Uh, there's so many other wonderful things about the Passion story, powerful things, I should say, and we heard this, of course, at, on Palm Sunday this year. Uh, but when you turn, uh, I, I said the overall thing, Jesus as the just one and the faithful Son of God, uh, you know, this is going to be the strong uh, emphasis that comes through uh, in this story. And, uh, you know, I think one of the things to keep in mind, and maybe it's why Matthew you know, absorbs Mark's focus on the passion. Uh, because this is also the passion of the community. You know, the community that, you know, maybe is suffering some persecution, 
Matthew's community, but more importantly, and probably more wrenchingly, undergoing incredible transformation. In the wake of the uh, destruction of the temple, the wrenching apart uh, within the Jewish community, the tension between Matthew's Jewish Christian community and the wider Jewish community, uh, the coming in now of new Gentiles coming into the, the community and the, the, the seeming dissolving of their sacred traditions because of this, this kind of thing that a community that, you know, certainly the Catholic community has gone through in the last 50 years, that kind of wrenching changes for some, I think is also part of the passion narrative here uh, of this turning point in history, an underlying motif of, of suffering. But if you look in, uh, especially starting in chapter 27, uh, verse 32, uh, here is the scene at Golgotha. Before this, we've had the trial scene, Barabbas or Jesus. I mentioned about the choices and so on. That's done now, and they're, they're coming up, and uh, the dividing and close, all of this is very, uh, almost literally the same as in Mark's text. Over his head in verse 37, they put the charge against him. This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. But then you have uh, the mockeries beginning in verse 38. The two bandits were crucified with him, one on his right and one on his left. Those who passed by derided him, shaking their heads. Uh, by the way, shaking their heads, uh, this is in Psalm 22. Mockers stand around me, shaking their heads is like a... a kind of derision, I guess, an uh, attitude of contempt, saying you would destroy the temple, build it in three days, save yourself. If you are the Son of God, come down from the cross. Uh, uh, in Mark, it's save yourself and come down from the cross. And Matthew adds, if you are the Son of God. If you remember in the temptation story, Satan kept saying, if you are the Son of God, uh, throw yourself down. And then along with his scribes and the elders were mocking him, saying, He saved others, he cannot save himself. He is the king of Israel, let him come down from the cross now and we will believe in him. This is right from Mark also, and very much part of Mark's uh, casting of the scene, the attempt to separate Jesus from the cross. Uh, come down from the cross and we will see and believe in you. This very much, uh, you know, against the grain of Mark's insistence that the death of Jesus was essential to his mission. The Son of Man has come not to be served, to serve, to give his life and ransom for the many. Uh, then verse 43 is not found in Mark. Verse 43 is from Psalm 22 and Wisdom chapter 2. He trusts in God, let God deliver him now if he wants to, for he said, I am God's son. So here, you know, Matthew infuses in this uh, theology of trust, if you like, that is the, the main motif of Psalm 22 and of those, that second chapter of the Book of Wisdom about the just one, and he draws the words from those texts and puts it here. And the bandits who were crucified him also taunted him in the same way. So the chorus of mockery. And then you move into uh, the moment of the death of Jesus. And again, uh, following Mark, but with significant changes. Uh, from noon on, the darkness came over the whole land. Most people think this is a quotation from Hosea uh, about the sort of eschatological darkness, the darkness of the day of judgment. At three o'clock, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lama samatani. This is the quote from Psalm 22, verse 1. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Uh, there's a lot of discussion, as you read in commentaries, both in, in Mark and Matthew. It, both Mark and Matthew use Psalm 22. Luke does not, and John does not. They go a different direction, as you know. But it's, it's Mark and Matthew that have focused on this lament. And, uh, you know, some say, is this a cry of despair? You have a lot of modern interpreters will, will say that. Uh, others say no, inciting the first verse and the fact that there's echoes of this psalm in what follows. The Matthean community, the biblically literate community, know that this is a prayer. This is the first 
verse of a psalm. So Jesus is lamenting, but it's not simply an existential cry of anguish or despair. It is a, a lamenting prayer, <laughs> forceful, deeply emotive, uh, out of the midst of darkness, but still addressing God, my God, my God. And then you have a similar in uh, Matthew, in Mark, a little cheeny changes of style, but this man is calling Elijah, and they go and get the uh, wine, put it on a stick, and gave it to him. Others said, wait, let's see whether Elijah will come to save him. You have the same proposition as in Mark to separate him. But it's in verse 50 that uh, Matthew does a couple of things that very much changes it from Mark. Uh, in Mark's gospel, uh, if you were to look at Mark in chapter 15, uh, 33, he, he says that Jesus, uh, aphes, I'll put it deliberate. Phonain, megalain. So Jesus letting a face, letting out a phonane sound, a loud megalene, a great scream, okay. Exopanusen, he expires, okay. It's very stark, you know, there's no, uh, no content to it. So he, he, he screams and he dies, okay. And the, the description for dying is expire, okay. Ex panuo, he breathes out, okay. Couldn't be any more stark than what Mark is. Total giving of life. Matthew changes this, okay? And it may not be evident in, in the English translation, but he goes, he goes, Krogsas. Yes. Krogsas. Uh, Palin. Aphes. Ton Panuma. So he uses the word kragsas to cry out. Okay? Uh, Mark had used emitting a loud scream. Matthew used kragsas. Why is that significant? Because uh, when in the first quotation of Psalm 22, it says, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lama sabatani. In the Septuagint translation of Psalm 22, when you have, I cried out by night, I cried out by day, it's the Greek word kragsos, okay, kragsos. So this is what the psalmist is doing. He's, he's crying out uh, to God. And then Matthew says, Paulin, it's again, okay. He adds the word again. He's crying out again. In other words, he's, he's continuing to pray Psalm 22. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And then he, Afiken tom penuma. That should be Ken. He, instead of exapanua to expire, he hands over his spirit. Okay. He hands over his spirit. And uh, this is, is, you know, the commentators uh, uh, recognize that there is a, a deliberation here. So you all have the sense Jesus is crying out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He continues to cry out the psalm. And at the moment of his death, he takes his life breath and he gives it back to God. Okay. And this uh, is very reminiscent, and most people think that Matthew is actually alluding to it, to the end of Kohelet, the uh, Ecclesiastes. Uh, if you remember, there's this purple passage at the end of Kohelet, which is the death of the village. You know, it's a very uh, gripping, uh, not a very cheerful, but a very gripping uh, uh, thing where he describes the village sort of dying. You know, when the caper berry no longer has any punch, when the grasshopper drags along, when the pulley breaks at the well, when people close the shutters, when the birds of song no longer sing, it goes on like this, you know. It's like you, you see death going out and man gives his life breath back to God and he returns to the dust of the earth. Vanity of vanities, all is vanity. <laughs> and, and what this is a play upon is uh, 
especially Jewish interpreters have noted, is the second creation account. In the second creation account, you remember, God makes a bag of clay and breathes into the clay. <laughs> he breathes the penuma. And the rabbis would say that the human being is a bag of clay with the breath of God inside. That's why even in Hebrew, the, the word for neck is nefesh. It's the breathing tube you know, that God breathes into, you know, if you think of this anthropomorphically. And, and so the, the true death, if you like, the true in the sense of, of obedient death, the person, the human being gives back to God the penuma, the life breath, and the person returns to the earth from which they came. And this is, is Matthew shapes this instant of Jesus' death in a text that he's been very closely following Mark, and he alters it at this point. And then what happens, the big alteration, if you look back to your text, uh, in Mark, what happens, the veil of the temple is torn in two, and the centurion says, seeing how he died, truly this man was the son of God. Matthew has a very dramatically different text. Uthus, immediately, at that moment, apotota, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook, the rocks were split, the tombs were opened, and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. And after his resurrection, they came out of the tombs and entered the holy city and appeared to many. Now when the centurion and those with him who were keeping watch over Jesus saw the earthquake and the phenomena, ta gadamana, the things that were happening, they were terrified and said, truly this man was God's son. That's all one sentence in the Greek. <laughs> so this, this uh, some have described this, it's like a cosmic rip. Okay. So the, the curtain of the temple, which symbolized in Jewish theology, sort of the canopy between the heavens and the earth. There's a lot of commentaries about that, that the veil before the, the Holy of Holies was a sense separated the realm of God from the realm of the human. It was like the Shemayim, you know, like the canopy of the heavens. So Matthew's description is there's the tearing open, in a sense of the Shemayim, there's the tearing open of the earth and there's a tearing open of the graves and the people come out of the graves, the holy ones. Okay. It's the resurrection, it's the general resurrection that's happening in response to the death of Jesus. Okay. And, uh, and then the acclamation, truly this man was the son of God. Yeah. Uh, you think of the wisdom text, let us see if God wants him. You know, he says he is the son of God. You know, let God deliver him if he wants him. So, Matthew, uh, in his community, in this text, in this kind of tableau, this is God's answer, the liberation of the dead, the opening of, of the earth, and the raising of the tombs, the raising of people from the tombs. So this is really, uh, I, I think it's this very early theology of the community, uh, a vindication theology. God vindicates the trust of Jesus. God, the, the crucifixion is human no to Jesus. It mocks his trust. And God's action is the yes to Jesus. Uh, it, it underscores his identity as the chorus of the centurion and his company. They say truly he is the son of God. This is sort of like the, the, the central pillar of the whole theology of Matthew uh, being reaffirmed here. So uh, I don't know how that strikes you, but, but it's, this scene is so uh, uh, deliberate, I think, on the part of Matthew. You know, this way of portraying uh, this uh, very dramatic scene. He, he also runs into a little problem, if you notice, in verse 53. Uh, after his resurrection, they came out of the tombs because you know, Matthew wants the resurrection of Jesus to be the, the first, but so the, some of the old commentaries, when you read them, wonder what, where were these, uh, for what were they doing between, you know, Friday and Sunday? <laughs> you know, <were> they, <laughs> just like some of the old commentaries also, I got a kick out of reading some of them, would, when Pilate's wife, comes to Pilate during the trial and say, you know, I've been troubled 
with a dream and account of this man. They want to know where was Pilate the night before that his wife had to come in the morning and tell him about her dream. <laughs> you know, so they would go off and moralizing that this guy was up to no good anyway and this is why he had troubles with Jesus, etc. So a homilist can run with that if you want to. For... So the, 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 I, I find this, you know, uh, this thing here without uh, sort of homilizing about it, but this notion of presenting the death of Jesus as an act of trust is a very interesting <laughs> notion. Uh, you know, that, that death in a sense poses uh, a question. Uh, the Book of Wisdom, you know, says there are three things that cry out to God for justification. One is the prosperity of the wicked. The other is the death of the young. And the third is sterility. Okay. Those are three great sufferings that uh, cry out to God <laughs> for explanation. And, and I, I think that, you know, Matthew is influenced by that kind of bold uh, thinking in a way in a religious culture in which God's overwhelming power was so publicly acknowledged, yet death puts the question mark before it. And particularly puts a question mark in terms of relationship. Yeah. Uh, Jesus, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Uh, so that, you know, the last sort of thread holding Jesus, uh, the meaning of his life together is his relationship with his father. As we've seen in chapter 11, no one knows the father but the son. And no one knows the son but the father. Uh, that beautiful, uh, you know, sense of intimacy here in the Math Matthew's gospel is tested at this moment. Okay. The resurrection uh, account here uh, of... Uh, in Matthew 28 uh, is, you know, he follows through in uh, the, the sense of, of, I would call the eschatology, the final days, you know. When in doubt, you always have to throw the word eschaton in there, you know. It's a, <laughs> but, you know, it means the final things. It's a vision of the, the, the destiny, the final uh, outcome. And uh, if you notice, one of the differences in Matthew's account of the empty tomb is in verse 2 of chapter 28. Again, the women who were faithful, who observed, you know, back in verse 55 of chapter 27, uh, who had followed Jesus from Galilee, provided for him, diakonain, literally served him. Uh, they're the ones who see where he's buried, and then uh, they come uh, at the beginning of the, the after the Sabbath, a Sunday morning, and suddenly there was a great earthquake. This is not in Mark. For an angel of the Lord descending from heaven came and rolled back the stone and sat on it. And his appearance was like lightning and his clothing white as snow. This is as close as you get in, in the New Testament to the actual description of the resurrection. <laughs> None of the texts describe the moment of resurrection. Okay, it's the empty tomb, it's the appearances of Christ. But here you get very close to it. You know, uh, that we have the angel coming, rolling back the tomb and sitting on it. You know. Yes, Christine. Oh, sorry, it went off, did it? Did I hit it? Or is this an act of, it's on. Uh, how do I, I think it's, yes. Okay. Can you hear me okay if I blast away? Okay. Uh, no, that's okay, Stephanie. Why don't we, we'll, ju we'll just finish off with this. But uh, so in Matthew, you, you, you're the scene that we had at the death of Jesus with the nature erupting and signs that Ezekiel would see as the rising of, of Israel back from its exile, from its being dead as a people. Now it's restored through the power of God. Matthew connects that to the death of Jesus and the resurrection of Jesus. So what's being raised is not simply Jesus being transformed through risen life, but it's like a new community is going to emerge from this. And that will be, of course, the, the message at the end 
And also, if you look in verse 9, uh, if you remember the Gospel of Mark, those who have read it closely or studied it, you know that most people believe that Mark's Gospel ended with chapter 16, verse 8, with the discovery of the empty tomb, with the proclamation of Jesus' resurrection by the messenger at the tomb, with the charge to the women to go and tell the disciples and Peter that he's going ahead of you to Galilee and there you will see him. And they leave in fear and ecstasy. They don't say anything to anyone and go about their business, go about their mission. But in Matthew, he actually has Jesus appear to the women. Uh, they left the tomb with fear and great joy. This is at Phobos Chi Ecstasis. It's a beautiful combination that's already found in Mark. And they ran to tell his disciples. And suddenly Jesus met them and said, Kyrie, greetings. And they came to him and they took hold of his feet and they worshipped him. Proskune alton. This is, you know, Matthew's Christology here, the restoration of Jesus, uh, the Son of God, uh, the manifestation of who Jesus is, is right to the surface of the text. And he said to them, do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee. There they will see me. So in, in Matthew's text, Jesus himself reinforces uh, the message of the angel. And then, you know, you have a little segue here about the report of the guards, as I mentioned earlier. But the real uh, ending of the gospel, of course, is in chapter uh, 28, 16 to 20, where Jesus appears to the disciples. Uh, they went to the Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. And this is wonderful. Verse 17 is wonderful, I think. When they saw him, they proskune again. Matthew has this verb several times. They did this in the boat when he was walking on the water. You know, when he got into the boat, they, it's proskune. It's the bend of the knee. They're, they're genuflecting. They're worshiping him. And so he says they worshiped him. Hoide idastas. Some doubt it. Okay, so, I mean, it's like, you know, Cecil B. DeMille orchestrating this scene, and then a couple of the folk are off script. You know, they're still doubting. You know, we had, that's the same thing Peter did when the, remember, he said, come to me in the water. And he came and he felt the wind and the waves and he begins to sink. Lord, save me, I'm, I'm perishing. And Jesus said, why did you doubt? It's the same word. Why did you hesitate? So even here, the disciples are true to their <laughs> weak situation, the mixed community that Matthew's talked about in some of the parables. But then you have this uh, charge. All authority in heaven on earth has been given to me. Go therefore make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. And remember, I am with you always until the end of the age. Uh, so you, you end with this powerful mission charge and we had talked earlier in talking about mission that in many ways this is, this is not plan B. The mission to the Gentiles is not happening here because Israel the leaders rejected Jesus. No, the rejection was part of the travails, but this is where the gospel was going from the beginning. This, in a sense, is also the mission of Israel. <laughs> uh, so through Jesus and through the disciples that are faithful, through the people of Israel that are faithful, now in this new age, uh, the mission is open to all the nations. Okay, all the nations. The mission to Israel continues in chapter 10. It continues. But now that mission uh, is, uh, in a sense, subsumed into a broader and deeper mission uh, to, the, to the world. And, and then you have uh, that ending of, of Matthew. And I put the text here. Uh, identifying the community of the New Age. It's the community in which the risen Christ dwells. And those texts, 123, uh, is uh, in the infancy narrative, uh, they shall call him Emmanuel, that is, God with us. Okay. Then in 1820, this would be a good review for, <laughs> we just go by numbers. You should, your eyes should be moistening about now and you just hear the number. That's the community discourse. You know. 
where two or three are gathered, I am with you. And then 2820, this uh, one, I am with you always until the end of time, that comes in this uh, final climactic text. So uh, Matthew, when you think about it, if you compare it to Luke's sort of theological construct, if you like, or John's theological construct, in, in Luke, the risen Christ completes his mission and with ascension goes to the right hand of God and sends the Spirit on the community. And the risen Christ will not appear until the end of time <laughs> when he comes to gather uh, the nations. In John's Gospel, uh, Jesus ascends back to his Father. I am going to my Father and your Father. and All will be one. And he sends the paraclete to be with the community, help them to understand all things, and to confront the world, and so on and so forth. In Matthew, as someone said, you have a, a, a proleptic parousia. There you can use that word in tr trivial pursuits, okay? <laughs> in other words, the risen Christ has already come back. Yeah. He's come back, and he's with the community. I am with you always until the end of time. So. Uh, the final scene in the gospel, in a sense, is the parousia. It's uh, the risen Christ returning to his community and being with them and emboldening them. And you can think of chapter 16, you know, the gates of Hades will not uh, prevail against it and so on, all of this notion of protection. So uh, Matthew's sort of way of, you know, imagining, if you like, or constructing the the relationship of the risen Christ to the community is one of presence. He is present with them and guiding them. I am with you always. He is Emmanuel, God with us. I put then at the end uh, these major motifs. I, I won't read them through, but just, you know, try to collect, and maybe that's what, you know, all of us can do as we come to the end of a a commitment of time like you've all given to this uh, uh, this gospel uh, that uh, is such a powerful gospel and remember it became the key catechetical gospel for the early community uh, there's a lot of testimonial to that and, and I think because it has a certain completeness you know a certain maturity and gives us so much of the ethical teaching of Jesus as well as the example of his uh, healing and his, uh, his own uh, obedience. So I, I put there the gospel as a renewed founding story of the Christian community. I think that's what happened. Mark's text was revered by Matthew's community and the scenario I had mentioned in our very opening uh, session long ago, made fading in memory, uh, was that uh, some have said, you know, Matthew's community was equipped with a lot of uh, traditions about the teaching of Jesus and moved sort of up the Syrian corridor, you know, uh, and encountered in Antioch perhaps a place where the Gospel of Mark was strongly present. Matthew's community may have known of the Gospel of Mark before it migrated there, but it fuses the story of the passion the focus on the passion and the focus on the healings and exorcisms with this uh, body of teaching material that it had access to and creates, in a sense, a new founding story, particularly for the sake of a community and so much transition about their future, this Jewish Christian community uh, wanting them to you know, keep their roots uh, as they now become a mixed community and yet be open to the Gentiles. And that's, you know, the second one, it goes to the point of that, this mission Matthew's trying to say, it's all part of the plan, you know. Uh, the mission to the Gentiles is not a step back, it's not second best, it's what God is wanting through the instrumentality of uh, the people Israel, and particularly through Jesus who embodies all of the hopes of Israel. The focus on obedience, <coughs> This, uh, I always remember, and I cited to you earlier, the remark of W.D. Davies, that through the Gospel of Matthew, with its close understanding of Jewish ethical tradition, 
that all of that patrimony about justice, about forgiveness, about reconciliation, about integrity, all of that flows now into the life stream of the Christian community by means of the Gospel of Matthew. That, that aspect, that Jewishness of Jesus uh, is now uh, part of our patrimony. And then we saw within that body of teaching the focus on the love command. Uh, very clear that Matthew sees that, that, that all of the ethical teaching of the gospel hangs on the love command, as Matthew says in chapter 22. And then it reveals, therefore, a God who is a compassionate, loving God, you know, and, and Jesus striving to be faithful to this God, even in the, the darkness, if you like, the realm of death, as he encounters it on the cross. And then this notion in, verse, in number six there, uh, this sense of gathering, you know, the renewing of the people of Israel, the, the lost, uh, the alaka stone, the least, you know, what we saw in the community discourse, uh, it's not the will of your father that a single one of these little ones should go astray, should be lost. Unlimited forgiveness. There's a beautiful ecclesiology in Matthew of sort of an inclusive uh, community, a fostering community. And then a community that in a sense is protected, you know, a community in which the risen Christ, Emmanuel, resides until the end of time, protecting it from the assault of evil that's present in the world and trying to take Matthew's view of things here and bringing it to fulfillment. This sense it's a fragile community, they're still doubting, it's a community with conflicts, but it's the community in which uh, the risen Christ is present. So uh, Matthew is a rather remarkable text, I think, our sacred text. Uh, we're glad it's still around. <laughs> and we hope that some proximity to uh, interpreting it. And now as a prize for your fidelity, you get to look at the take-home exam for that. <laughs>